dread familiar. This is episode two of The Dread Familiar. For myself and many others, being scared by a good story is an experience that helps us cope with our normal lives. A controlled outlet for stress and fear in a setting that can't hurt us, as far as we know. Tonight I'm bringing you a story that was submitted to me through submissions at thedreadfamiliar.com. This is the primary method I'd like to use to get new content for this show, submissions from you, the listener. I've already received quite a few, and I'm in the process of reading and selecting from them, and I still have room for several more. I'm also taking submissions for readers, so if you're a voice actor, a podcaster, or simply love to read, head over to thedreadfamiliar.com where you'll find basic information about submission requirements, as well as a general email if you have any feedback or questions. Tonight's story was written by Dylan Dismitt, and that is the only thing I know. Perhaps Dylan is an alias, and is actually the one who experienced the tale you're about to hear. If, on the other hand, I do get more information for additional stories, etc., I will share that in a future episode. So without further ado, this is Experiment N99 by Dylan Dismitt. I used to work at the old factory off Route 63. You know the one. It's abandoned now, has been since 83. Kids go there to fuck around all the time. They're unaware of what went down there, and up until now, I've kept my mouth shut about what happened in that factory in the summer of 83. Been too scared to say anything, really. Those government assholes made it clear that if any of us said a word about it, they'd find us. And I have no doubt that they would. Hell, I'm pretty sure they did. Ernie Barnes just dropped off the face of the earth a few years back. And Art Reynolds died in that fire in 91. Everyone said it was an accident, but I say otherwise. He called me a week before it happened, said he thought he was being watched. And then, just like that, he was gone. Fell asleep with a cigarette in his hand. Bullshit. Yeah, I've kept my mouth shut for a long time, but the thing is, I ain't got much time left. Doctors tell me three months at the most, four if I'm real lucky. Cancer's a real cunt. Hell, I'd almost rather they come find me. Can't imagine it would be any worse. I'd almost welcome it. And besides, the world needs to know. I don't know all of it, but I know enough. I know the guys working there that summer fucked with something they shouldn't have. Cost more than a few people their lives, too. And for what? Not a goddamn thing. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Some people still think the factory shut down in late August, but that's not entirely true. The factory actually shut down earlier that year in May. That was when the men in the gray coats took over. There was never a warning, never any clear explanation as to why. But one day we all came into work and were told we would no longer be mass producing tires. Most of us were let go on the spot, but the men in the gray coats kept some of us on. I was a maintenance worker, suppose that's why I got to stay. Besides, they needed some people there to keep it looking like everything was normal. None of us asked any questions. In those days, you didn't ask questions. You just shut the fuck up and did what you were told. But we speculated in private, yes sir. Everyone who stayed behind had their own ideas about what was going on in the back rooms of that plant. Some of those ideas would have made your skin crawl. Some of them were actually pretty close to the truth. But it wasn't until August when the plant really did shut down for good that we got to know the real truth. And by then it was too late. August 5th was the day everything went to shit. That was the day of the screaming. I can't say for sure if anyone was killed that day, but I would be willing to bet money on it. Yes, sir. It was around noon when the screaming started, and it lasted all of 30 seconds. But what a long 30 seconds it was. All of us out in the main room just stopped what we were doing and listened to the commotion coming from the back room. I had never heard anything like it. I don't think anyone had. Thing was, we rarely ever heard a peep coming from the back room. Up until then, I was certain the room had been soundproofed. 
but I learned real fast how wrong I had been. Someone back there was in a lot of pain, and we were hearing every second of it. I remember praying to God that they would be put out of their misery. I guess my prayers were answered because a moment later it was silent. Somehow the silence was worse. It was the silence of death. I'm sure some of you will know exactly what I'm talking about. I never forgot it. I've had nightmares ever since. Of course, the worst was yet to come. We stood there out in the main room for what seemed like an eternity, every one of us silent. Finally, Justin Beeman said, Fuck this, I'm done, and walked out the door. He never came back to the plant. Far as I know, he's got a nice piece of land out in Wisconsin now. Good for him. I don't blame him for getting as far away from this cursed town as possible. Soon after, the door to the back room opened and one of the men in gray coats stepped out. He took one look at all of us and I'm sure he recognized the fear in our eyes. His lip quivered for a minute, then he said, There has been an accident, but everything is fine. Please go back to work. Then just like that, he returned to the back room. Accident my ass, Ernie Barnes said, but that was it. We got back to work, no questions asked, because you didn't ask questions. And besides, we were all too damn scared to ask questions. But we would get answers soon enough. Yes, sir. Thinking back, I wish I had left with Justin Beeman. Two weeks later, as we were leaving the plant for the day, one of the men in gray coats met us outside. This was unusual. We never saw any of them except for early in the morning when they were entering the building. None of them ever left that back room, let alone approach us on our way out the door. They did not associate with us. Period. I recognized this one. He was quite a few years younger than the rest of them. Looked like he was just out of college. An intern, maybe. Doesn't really matter. He was standing by the side of the building, looking around nervously and motioning for us to come over. A few of the guys ignored him, but Ernie Barnes, Art Reynolds, Chip Rannigan, Benny Thomas, and myself decided to go talk to him. I could see he was frightened. I knew this was probably breaking every rule he was supposed to be following, but I guess he didn't care. He didn't introduce himself. I had never heard the names of any of the men in the gray coats, so this was no surprise to me. I'm not sure they even had names. They preferred to remain anonymous, and I can't say I blame them. You all need to get out of here, the kid said. Just quit. Things aren't going the way they were supposed to. Just leave before things get worse. What the hell is going on back there? Chip asked him. It doesn't matter, the kid responded. You should all just go. Chip laughed. Here's the thing, though. It does matter. You people just come in here and take over without any explanation and expect us to just go about our lives. Something fucking weird is going on back there and we deserve to know what it is. Fuck, we should have at least called the cops last week when we heard all that screaming. It was the kid's turn to laugh. The cops wouldn't have done shit. They couldn't have the company I work for. We have our ways of keeping people out of our business. And what company is that? I asked. He shook his head. Not gonna tell you that, but we're the ones the government calls in when they stumble on something interesting. What do you mean interesting? Benny Thomas asked. Like the UFO crash at Roswell, like the Bermuda Triangle, like motherfucking Bigfoot. But this, what's happening here is enormous. We shouldn't have fucked with it. We should have left it alone. We had no idea. Tell us or I'll bash your face in. Ernie Barnes was not kidding. The kid looked around nervously, then said, Not here. I shouldn't even be talking to you now. Meet me tonight at that bar on Main Street, 9.30. They gonna follow you there? I asked. He shook his head. No, they're too preoccupied with making sure nothing goes wrong here. I think I should be fine. Turns out he wasn't fine after all. After that night, I never saw that kid at the plant again. I'd be lying if I said I didn't know what happened to him. Same thing that happened to Art Reynolds and Ernie Barnes. The government doesn't like people giving away their secrets. But at least he got to tell us about Experiment N-99. 
A few months ago, my company located some strange energy in your town. He began, once we had all gathered around the booth at the bar. Turns out, it was a rift. What's a rift? Benny Thomas asked. A thin spot. A gateway to another world. It's actually quite common. These rifts are extremely temperamental. When one appears, they tend to spread rapidly. And the more they spread, the higher the chance they open up. And that's not something we want to happen. And why is that? Ernie asked. I could tell by the tone of his voice that he wasn't buying it. I think the kid could tell too. He smiled. Because when they open, sometimes things get out. And some of those things aren't very nice. My company was sent in to isolate the rift so that it didn't spread. Should have only taken a few hours. The plan was to show up here in the middle of the night and take care of it. We would have been in and out of your town and nobody would have known we were there. But that's not how it went down. Not at all. When we arrived, it almost immediately became clear that this rift was different than most we had seen. It was emitting energy patterns that weren't... Uh, normal. I guess that's the best way to put it. I don't really know all of the details, only what I heard being passed around. I'm not exactly high up on the ladder there. I don't always get all the details. I do know that the higher-ups were flown in to investigate, and they must have found something very interesting, because the next thing you know, we were setting up shop in your factory. It was the perfect place to work where nobody could bother us. But something went wrong, very, very wrong. We started to experiment with it, trying to harness its energy, control it. <laughs> that was arrogant. We should have known what would happen. He paused for several moments and stared into his beer. For a second I thought he wouldn't continue. That he would realize he had already said too much. But at long last, he spoke again. Our test led us to discover that the air on the other side of the rift was not unlike our own. We decided to see where it led, what was on the other side. That was the day of the incident that I'm sure you are all well aware of. That was the day I decided I was done. I'm only still working there because I'm trying to figure out a way to get away. I'm afraid of what they'll do to me if I just up and go. We decided to send someone in. We had been sending small animals in for some time and they had all come back unscathed. And trust me, we did everything we could to make sure that really was the case. So, we decided to send a human into the rift. Again, arrogant. When it all came down to it, we still had no idea what might be on the other side of the rift. Christ, we still don't. Not really, I mean, we're talking about a completely different world here. That we even thought for a second we had it figured out. It makes me nauseous just thinking about it. Ernie interjected. You want to hurry this up a little? I don't have all night. Just tell us what happened back there. Uh, what's happening back there? The kid nodded. We sent one of our guys into the rift. Rick Johnson. I should even tell you his name, but who the fuck cares? Rick was attached to a cable just like the animals had been. Didn't want him getting lost and not being able to find his way out. We would have sent him in with a video camera too, but the cameras we had attached to the animals had all come back fried. It would have been pointless. He was in there for less than five minutes. That's all it took. Then he came walking back through the rift into our world. At first glance, it seemed nothing had changed, but soon we found out that wasn't true at all. We asked him what had been in there, why he had returned so quickly, he told us he had seen the ruins of a city set against the horizon of a blood-red moon. There had been stars in the sky, but like the moon they had been crimson. The city had been full of windowless skyscrapers. Many had been crumbling before his eyes. Beyond the city had been an endless wasteland, in the center of which stood a crooked tower that reached high into the black sky. It was a ruined world, he had said. There were ghosts there. Those words have haunted me ever since. He said no more about what had been on the other side of the rift, only that he didn't feel well and needed to sit down. We let him, though we all had so many questions, we still do. 
He sat there for roughly 15 minutes, not saying a word. We went about our business, thinking it best to just leave him be for a while. Then suddenly he stood up and started shouting that we never should have sent him in there, that he had brought something back with him, and that we were all going to die. To be honest, he sounded like a raving lunatic. I wish to God that had been the case. A moment later, he grabbed the nearest person and ripped her throat out with his teeth. I think she died before she even had time to register what had happened. I've never seen so much blood. There was a moment of silence throughout the room as our brains struggled to understand what we were witnessing. Then Johnson began to scream. That's what you heard. So you should know there was nothing even remotely human about it. The change happened so fast. Johnson's skin began to turn a sickly green. His face was distorted. That's the best way I can describe it. There was saliva and blood dripping from his mouth, and he just stood there screaming and looking wildly around the room, madness in his eyes. Suddenly, he charged another one of the employees. That's when we finally reacted. One of our many security guards shot Johnson in the head. I'm sure you heard that too. And Johnson dropped, but he wasn't dead. No way, far from it. He lay there on the ground, groaning and writhing around. Again, we didn't know how to react. Quite frankly, we were all in shock. Other than Johnson's groaning, the room was silent. That silence was broken by one of our supervisors yelling for us to get him the fuck out of there. So we did. We brought him, still writhing, to one of the makeshift containment cells we had conveniently crafted in case we captured something from the other side of the rift. And that's where he's been for the last few weeks, though there's not much left of him. Ernie Barnes interrupted again. What, is he disintegrating or something? There was no humor in his voice. Even so, the kid laughed. <laughs> if only that were true, he said. No, no, what I mean is, Johnson is no longer Johnson. Maybe there's some small part of him deep down in the back of his mind somewhere. But as far as I'm concerned, Rick Johnson is dead. Whatever was in there on the other side latched onto him like some sort of macabre leech and changed him into something that was anything but human. Used him as a host so that it could survive in our world. At first, we tried to stop the process. We did everything we could, but the bottom line is that we had no idea what we were dealing with. Our efforts to save him all failed, and we were left with the monster he had become. Once we realized we couldn't save Rick, we closed the rift, or contained it anyway. Turns out it's too powerful to close, but we're managing it, making sure nothing else can get in, or more importantly, out. The rift is old news anyway. Johnson has become our main priority. We call it Experiment N99. We've been doing tests on it, as many as we can to try to figure out exactly what the hell it is, and what it's capable of. And what did you find out? I asked. Not much, he responded. It's not like anything we've ever seen before. It's essentially an animal. Well, at first anyway. During the first few days, it didn't really show any signs of real intellect, just pure animal instinct. We were able to sedate it so that we could run all the tests, but now... We waited. He seemed lost in thought. Now it's different. It keeps changing, not only in appearance, but in its mannerisms as well. It's begun to anticipate our actions. At first, we thought it was rapidly evolving and adapting to its surroundings, but I think it's just growing up, or getting used to its new host body, or something. I don't know. But something's different. It's no longer an animal. We can't get near it anymore, unless, of course, it wants us to. What the hell does that mean? Ernie asked. The kid shook his head. I don't know, but it has a way of luring people near it. Our earliest tests on it detected some rather unique brainwave patterns. At first, we couldn't figure out what that meant, but now we're speculating that it's using some sort of telekinesis. Again, another reason to think it's simply growing up. There were several incidents that led us to have to modify the containment cell to block its brainwaves. Some of our guys nearly met rather unfortunate ends. 
So you get the picture of what we're dealing with here. This is not something that should be a part of this world. I've seen plenty of weird shit working this job, but this thing takes the cake. I wish you could see it. Can we? Benny asked. The kid just laughed. We already knew the answer to that question. He continued. This morning I made a huge mistake. I was sent in for a routine examination of our little experiment. Had to make sure its vitals were good and there were no abnormalities, shit like that. But I fucked up. I got too close and it, it got inside my head or something. I felt some invisible force gripping my brain, and the next thing I knew I was no longer in control of my own body. I saw myself going for the board that controlled the containment cell, saw myself typing in the code that would have opened the door and set the monster free. It took everything I had to stop myself before completing the code. I managed to pry myself away from the grip that thing had on my mind. And the whole time it just sat there staring at me with its black eyes, and I swear to God it was smiling. I knew then that we were dealing with something that was out of our hands, and that we were not going to be able to control it for long. I told anybody I could about what had happened, even showed them the security tapes. They believed me. Of course they did, our job is to believe the unbelievable. But they wouldn't do anything about it, it's just another interesting development in their eyes. They'll just keep doing their experiments and tests, and sooner or later that thing is going to get out. And I'm not going to be around when it does, so I'm leaving. Tonight. I wish I had some sort of plan, but it is what it is. They'll try to stop me, but at this point I don't give a shit anymore. With that, he stood up and looked around nervously, as if he thought someone was watching him. Take it how you will, but I'm going to suggest you get the hell out of that place as well. Before you can't. Then he walked out of the bar. That was the last any of us saw of him. To this day, I still don't 100% know for sure if he actually quit, or if he was, as they say, taken care of. I'd be willing to bet it was the latter. None of us said anything for some time. We just sat there at the bar, holding our drinks but not drinking, as we wrapped our heads around everything the kid had just told us. It seemed insane, every last bit of it. But at the same time, I don't think any of us doubted him for a second. It was Ernie that finally spoke. I ain't leaving. I got a wife and three kids. I need this job. I don't care what they're doing back there. Not my problem. Ernie Barnes, the voice of reason. He was right. None of us could afford to just up and quit. We decided we'd all go home and sleep on it, collectively decide and discuss it in the morning. Of course, we never did have that discussion. We simply came in the next day, after a night of very little sleep, and got to work. The topic wasn't even brought up. Looking back, we should have just quit. It was three weeks later that shit hit the fan. August 26th, the day the factory shut down for good. It happened fast. It's safe to say that we had all been on edge since the day of the screaming, but since the night at the bar, things had become far more tense. Anytime the door to the back room would open, our hearts would skip a beat. Anytime there was an announcement over the loudspeaker, we would hold our breath. We spent every waking second anticipating some unspeakable horror to come bursting through the door. It's a wonder none of us up and quit. Unfortunately, though our guard was up, nothing could have prepared us for August 26th. Like I said, it happened fast. One second, we were going about our business, and then the next, there was more screaming from the back room. This time, the screams were unmistakably human screams of terror. But there was something else, too. It was mostly masked by the human screams, but we all heard it. It was the screaming we had heard during the first incident, but it had changed. It was lower, more animalistic. Without being told, we knew exactly what was going on back there. Experiment N99 had gotten out, and it was laying down the law, so to speak. 
A shaky voice suddenly made an announcement over the loudspeaker telling us not to panic and that everything was under control. But it seemed to me that whoever was making that announcement was panicking and that everything was most certainly not under control. I say we get the fuck out of here, said Ernie Barnes. I'm not sticking around waiting for that thing to come out here. Once again, Ernie Barnes, the voice of reason. Seconds later, as we were packing up our stuff to go, the back room door flew open and one of the men in gray coats came running out. His face was ghost white. He was missing an arm. There was blood everywhere. He started to run, but he didn't get far before being shot in the back of the head by one of his co-workers. Said co-worker then slammed the door to the back room shut, once more muffling the sound of carnage. I should have been shocked, but I was just confused. At first, anyway. Besides, it turns out seeing a one-armed man get shot in the head isn't nearly as shocking as you would think. Not if you saw what we all saw in the few seconds that the door was open, anyway. That poor guy's death was child's play compared to what was happening in the back room. I still have nightmares about it. I saw the men and women in gray coats running aimlessly around the room in a desperate attempt to flee. I saw broken glass and lab equipment. I saw blood on the walls and floor. I saw several people dead on the ground, lying in pools of their own blood and entrails. One had been not so neatly decapitated. I saw three men simply standing there, blank looks on their face as they witnessed what was happening. They shot several of their co-workers who happened to make a break for the door, and that's when it clicked. I remembered that the kid had told us in the bar that night about Experiment N99 having psychic powers or some shit. Guess that must have been true because I'm pretty sure it was controlling those guys and making them shoot anyone who tried to escape. It didn't want any survivors. I still don't know how Mr. One-Arm got as far as he did. Poor bastard. I saw all of this in a matter of seconds, and I saw one more thing as well. I'm sure you can guess what I'm talking about. Experiment N99 stood about six feet tall, with long, reaching arms that were roughly twice the length of its body. Its fingers still resembled those of humans, but they were far too long. Its long black hair mostly covered its face, but beneath it I could see greenish skin and what looked like small horns protruding from its head. It was still wearing the remains of a gray coat, the last trace of its former humanity. All of this in seconds, then the door slammed shut and I saw no more. Some of us had left by then, but there were those that remained. I like to kid myself that I stayed because I was in shock, but deep down I know it was just the sick curiosity to see how it all played out. Minutes later, there was a final gunshot, and then it was over. There was silence from the back room. Horrible, sickening silence. I thought for sure they were all dead back there, and that any moment the door would open, and that thing would walk through, and that would be the end of us. But that's not what happened. The door did open, but it was not Experiment N99 that exited the room. It was two men and a woman. Their gray coats were bloodstained, and there was no color in their faces. But they were alive, and they didn't appear to be under mind control. The woman cleared her throat. There has been an accident, but everything is under control now. You are all excused from work for the time being. You will be notified when you are to return. Bullshit, Art Reynolds said, matter-of-factly. That was no accident. You sons of bitches mess with something you shouldn't have, and it bit you in the ass. We don't know what you're talking about, the woman replied mechanically. I could tell by the tone of her voice that she knew we weren't having it. Right, said Art. He looked around at the rest of us. We know what you've been doing back there, and you may have stopped it for now, but it's only a matter of time before it gets out again. And something tells me next time it'll be way worse. So I ain't coming back. Not tomorrow. Not when you notify us. Not ever. And then he simply walked out. We all followed. So ended my employment at the tire factory. I could have come back, but it wouldn't have mattered. Not only was the factory shut down several days later, 
but also the doors and windows were sealed shut with huge cement blocks. To a casual observer, I'm sure this seemed peculiar. But to anyone who had worked there, it was all too clear. Experiment N99 was still alive. They were sealing it away from the world. The men in gray coats had disappeared just as quickly as they had come. The day after the factory shut down, they were simply gone. However, that same day, a long black car pulled into my driveway. Out stepped a man dressed in a coat that was black as night. I didn't have to ask who he was. I knew. He knew he had no need to introduce himself. He simply approached and said, May I come in, Mr. Bridges? There are matters to discuss. Please do, I said, motioning for him to sit. You're here to tell me I need to keep my mouth shut about experiment N99. He laughed. There was no humor in it. <laughs> you were never supposed to know. But I do know. The world should know. If that thing ever gets out, but it won't. The world cannot know, and it would be in your best interest to never speak of it. And what will happen if I do? He smiled. You'll regret it. We don't like it when people share our business. Just don't say a word and everything will be fine. With that, he stood up and headed towards the door. Have a nice evening, Mr. Bridges, he said. Then he stepped out the door and that was the last I saw of him. I didn't have to ask the other guys if they had been paid a similar visit. I knew they had. For years I have not said a word, not to my wife, God rest her soul, not to my son or daughter-in-law, not to my granddaughter, not to a soul. But I'm telling now because I've got nothing else to lose. Whether it makes a difference or not, I don't know. But at least the tale will have been told. That's all I can do. I've visited the old factory fairly regularly over the years just to check. It's always the same. Kids have written graffiti on most of the walls. The floors are covered in trash and the remnants of what it used to be. The walls are crumbling and the windows are broken. But the back room remains sealed and I hope to God it stays that way. Sometimes at night, I will see long, black cars parked outside the building. And I'll know I'm not the only one keeping tabs. And sometimes, if it's very quiet out, I'll swear I can hear it screaming from behind those walls. I've never been a praying man, not even after I received the diagnosis. But I pray then. Yes, sir, I pray like a motherfucker. I pray for my town, I pray for my family, I pray for the world, oh please God, let that room stay shut, don't let it get out, please God. I hope you enjoyed this story, and that you'll be leaving with a comfortable chill running through your entire body. Again, if you have any feedback or submissions, go to thedreadfamiliar.com. And there's a contact slash submissions page. The Dread Familiar was created by Joel Hackett. Narration and music also by Joel Hackett. Story written by Dylan Dismit. I hope to hear from you soon. Thanks for listening. <laughs> <laughs>